Um, yeah, so um, thanks, Bill, for um, asking me to, to give a presentation here. Um, so I think I have to get used to talking to the um, to the, the webcam here, like everyone else who's, who's done this um, series. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about um, liquid jet and aerosol injectors for imaging um, biomolecules. Um, so I have a lot of interest in um, diffraction theory and analysis algorithms. Um, for, for generating electron density maps from diffraction data. And I'm also quite interested in, in the injectors that are needed to um, put these particles into the X-ray beam in the first place. Um, so I, I've sort of become quite interested in this over the last um, few years. And I, I thought I would give a talk that's kind of, um, it, it should be fairly practical and should tie together a lot of um, uh, both practical matters with aerosol and, and liquid jet injectors. and um, Maybe a little bit of, of the theory, but not too much on the theory. Uh, most of my experience is quite practical and empirical in nature. So um, I'll go over a lot of that stuff. And um, I guess in the beginning, just because I, we might have, or I might have quite a broad audience, maybe some students who aren't that familiar with um, X-Fail diffractive imaging, I have just a couple of slides in the beginning to sort of motivate some of these things. Um, so x is do an amazing thing, which is they combine atomic spatial resolution with um, dynamic time scales associated with atomic motion. Um, so that was um, sort of initiated um, in the publication record in, in this paper by Richard Neutze. So I suppose my cursor is visible to everyone. So Richard Neutze, um, who showed that um, if you have a sufficiently brief, uh, very intense X-ray pulse, despite the fact that you completely obliterate and vaporize a, a a molecule by that pulse, if the pulse is short enough, you get a diffraction pen from the undamaged state of that um, molecule. Um, so on the left here is a sort of typical um, uh, sort of geometry for, for a diffraction experiment that an XFL. So there are pulsed X-ray um, pulses uh, that are coming along and, and diffracting from a stream of particles that's rapidly being replenished and diffraction patterns being recorded at each pulse and possibly some additional hardware that um, initiates the reaction, say an optical laser, for example. Um, so there's a nice review paper that just came out recently by um, Christoph Boschet, and um, it covers all sorts of things in, in XFIL science, um, including um, uh, imaging biomolecules. There are other reviews in the literature that are quite good. So in the case of um, the things that we're interested in sort of in, within the bio XFIL community are, are, are crystallography, um, solution scattering, and single particle imaging. And crystallography in particular, I suppose, is the maybe the easiest of, of these techniques in a sense. So you have to grow crystals, which is uh, one of the um, limiting factors. But once you have crystals, you get symmetrically um, repeating uh, re uh, copies of the same molecule which lead to really intense Bragg diffraction, which um, most everyone who's listening to this is probably quite um, familiar with. Um, so we concentrate all of the diffraction intensity from many molecules uh, into these sort of discrete spots in the detector. And the good thing about that is that it, it allows us in, in to do two things, but it allows us in principle to sort of orient the, the object um, with respect to the lab frame, and it, it uh, allows us to overcome signals and noise barriers. Um, so one of the things that I'm quite interested in, um, in the context of doing x fell diffraction, is, is that if you illuminate crystals with uh, a coherent x fell pulse, um, and the crystal is small, so a finite size crystal, nanocrystals, um, you can see new features in the diffraction, which is the, the sort of coherent superposition that results not only from the bulk of the crystal, but also the, the termination of the edges of the crystal. And that leads to these features that you see in the, um, the pattern in the background. So that's a merge of about 100,000 patterns of catapsin B crystals. The crystal is shown over here, so it's a needle-like crystal. And what you can see is that um, there's diffraction intensity uh, beyond the Bragg condition. So normally the Bragg condition would say that you only see intensities wherever that, that condition is satisfied. But here we see intensities sort of spanning the continuum of, of reciprocal space, diffraction space. And so that's quite interesting. And, and what's neat about it is that you can use that, that information to solve for a structure sort of ab initio without um, prior information, um, which is really neat. We demonstrated that 
recently with um, some phony crystals that were made with the focused ion beam with the soft X-ray laser, the, the Fermi FEL. And uh, we'd like to do that with, with um, protein crystals next. So protein crystals are a lot more difficult um, in part because of the measurement process and because the signal is quite weak. So it's in interestingly the, um, the diffraction sort of midway between two neighboring Bragg peaks is, is sort of independent of the number of molecules in the crystal, um, which is a bit startling. So you, you have to record a lot of data and you want the background to be low and um, right, you want to sort of optimize the signal to noise in your measurements. And so what was good about this measurement is that it, it showed that we can do this. We can do it with an imperfect x pulse um, so the beam profile is sort of shown over here, and um, right, so it's imperfect, but it but it works. And what we recover is a continuous molecular transform um, from from uh, essentially crystal data. You guys know how to move that window, Yeah, you not do it from your computer. No, it's not on mine. That's on the Windows computer. Okay, so I'll try to work around that a bit. So I've got an extra window in my view. It doesn't show up. It's not connected. Like, is it not wirelessly connected? Okay, so I can work around it. So I just can't quite see where my pointer is sometimes. Okay, so that's really neat. So, um, right, new features in the diffraction data as a result of using coherent femtosecond pulses, um, which is great. Um, very intense pulses. Okay, the other um, extreme is, is single particle imaging, uh, which is under development because crystals can't always be grown. And if you can't grow a crystal, you have to contend with the fact that, that um, you can only shoot at, at particles that are isolated and don't give Bragg diffraction. Um, they do give diffraction nonetheless, um, but the signal is, is quite low. Um, so that, that experimental geometry is more or less the same, except for it's a stream of isolated particles instead of crystals. Okay, there's, here's a diffraction pattern that, that comes from a, a single virus. And um, this is coming from the latest um, data from the single particle um, initiative collaboration. Um, so this is a lot of people working together from many different institutes. Um, it's led by Slack and LCLS. And um, there's lots of progress being made. What you see is is, is more or less uh, an estimate of the photon counts from a single virus. And um, it keeps looking better and better. And what's sort of limiting at the moment is, is that we need a huge amount of patterns. So something like if cryo-electron microscopy is a guide to the number of patterns needed, we need something like a half a million um, such patterns. Um, so it places a really stringent requirement on the, um, the sample injectors. And it's quite remarkable that you can deal with extremely, no, extremely low noise or signal from each shot. And this is a really neat example that shows a mask-like object, which is over here, and um, some uh, projection images with x-rays using um, the detectors that we use in our diffraction measurements, um, each image having only about two and a half photons on average, and each one in a random and unknown orientation. And it, it's amazing that you can actually merge this uh, data together to form an image, despite the really low signal and, and not knowing their orientations. Um, so the result is on, on the bottom left there, after having passed through the EMC algorithm. So one, one might suspect at first that that would be impossible, but it, it certainly is. Um, this is a limited uh, case where you have only one rotational axis. Okay, and, and then another thing that I'm quite interested in is um, the CAM's really remarkable idea for doing angular correlations, uh, intensity correlation measurements from solution scattering. Um, so if you can't grow crystals and you only have isolated molecules or, or you know, sort of individual molecules, but you also want the molecules to be hydrated, um, Whereas in single particle imaging, they would be injected into a vacuum chamber in the gas phase. One might question sort of what the integrity of the structure of these, these samples are compared to their sort of physiological structure. Um, so Cam suggested a really uh, fascinating idea, and he was kind of ahead of his time, I guess, because he, he suggested this when there weren't any free electron lasers, um, which was just that if you have a bunch of molecules in solution and you take snapshot images of those, what would normally be a, a small angle or wide angle x-ray scattering pattern suddenly has new features in it, which are the, the intensity fluctuations due to the um, randomized orientations and positions of the molecules. Um, so one can try to pull out the um, information in those fluctuations and try to unscramble the, um, 
that information to re recover a, an electron density map of, the, of a single molecule. Okay, so CAM's prescription is to measure intensity correlations, which, which you can think of as, as the cross correlation between rings of intensity. Um, so, so this this can be done. We sort of showed it also in a, a really simple um, proof of principle experiment. What you see is on the upper left is a bunch of particles in random orientations. These are nano um, particles of, of made of gold. Um, so it's a it's a simple experiment. And what you see is the diffraction patterns from many shots, each of them having different fluctuations. And then the 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 angular correlations on the upper right there which upon averaging many patterns collapses to the angular correlation of a single molecule. Um, so, so this sort of basic idea is that an angular autocorrelation or cross-correlation is independent of the rotation of that molecule, at least about that axis, the axis of the beam. Again, on the bottom is the reconstruction of a, of a single nanorod. So th this was one of the, um, the first demonstrations of this. And um, one would hope to do this with with um, protein molecules, uh, the trouble being that um, signal to noise is extremely low for this method. Um, so what you see on the, the left there are a bunch of um, simulated um, intensity correlation patterns. So those are sort of autocorrelation patterns, the top for lysosome, the bottom for photosystem one, in rel relatively optimized conditions or, or very um, uh, sort of optimistic conditions. I mean, you could ignore most of the numbers on the right, except for the column that says S and R, which is signal to noise ratio, and which just peaks above one when you get to something like a million patterns um, with, with the maximum amount of flux that we can get from an XFL. So it seems like it's possible, but um, yet extremely difficult, and, and uh, places high demands on the um, sample injectors. Um, so the pattern that you see here is from uh, virus uh, particles in a liquid jet, and you can see that there's a bunch of background coming from the jet itself, and there's there's problems that also arise from the detector. So this premise that you can pull out these extremely subtle correlations from the sample means that you can differentiate those from the, the experiment. So the sample injectors are quite important for this, for that reason. Okay, so so there's lots of um, there's lots of uh, existing techniques like like serial femtosecond crystallography, which is becoming increasingly more sort of mainstream. And then there are these sort of far out ideas of of, um, of getting structures in cases where you don't have the, the sort of ideal conditions for SFX, serial femtosecond crystallography. And in some cases, we need some real breakthroughs in sample injectors. Okay, so so there's lots of different types of um, injectors um, for for shooting particles into an X-ray beam. Um, the, the ones that are sort of, I, I think, in fashion at the moment are um, the gas dynamic virtual nozzle liquid jet on the upper left there, aerodynamic lenses for single particle imaging, and then there's, for example, the viscous extrusion jet on the, um, on the mid right there, um, or also known as the LCP injector in the case that it injects on the pit at cubic phase um, crystals, um, which is great because it slows down the speed of, of, of the um, injection. So I won't talk about the ones on the right too much. So there's also electro spinning, um, which was developed by Ray Sierra and others at, at Pulse. And there's fixed target samples, um, which are fantastic because it, you can really get an extremely high delivery efficiency of, of the samples. You can hit most of your crystals. And if you do so carefully, position them carefully. So the, those are all in development. Um, and I'll, I'll look at the two on the left here. We'll see how far I get. I might run out of time before I fully get through the aerodynamic lenses, but I'll start with liquid jets. Um, so the, I guess the first question is, what, what do we need from a sample injector uh, to do imaging with, with X-Fells? Um, so, so one realization is that the X-Fell kind of blows up everything that it, everything that finds its way into the focus of the, the X-ray beam. Um, so it, it um, ionizes things like crazy and, and the coulomb explode. And what you see on the, the lower panel there, the images say, um, that's a liquid jet that's been exposed to, a, I think that's a femtosecond infrared laser. Um, uh, it looks much the same when you, when you hit a liquid jet with the, an X-ray beam. Um, it explodes and it's, it's disrupted in that area. One hopes that the um, disruption convex downstream of, of the liquid jet. Um, but there's at least some region where, where you, you simply can't expose in that same spot again. It, it's sort of vanished in a flicker of light. And that, that sets some requirements on the injector straight away. 
Um, so, for example, if you're running at a roughly 100 hertz, which is what the LCLS does, that's 120 hertz uh, to be precise. And if that blast radius is something like 100 microns, which is, I think, a, a, a rough estimate of what it might be, that tells you how fast to move these particles along. So you don't want to expose in that same uh, region again. Um, so it would say you need to move it about 100 or about a centimeter per second at 100 hertz. Um, but future source, sources are going to sort of reach the megahertz regime. So the European XFIL would, would be operating with bursts at 4.5 megahertz, so 220 nanoseconds between pulses, um, which would suggest that you need to practically reach um, sonic speeds of the jet if you have to sort of avoid this 100 micron um, damage region. So, so I don't know what the, the exact size of the damage region is. There's a lot of work um, going into that. Um, and um, we'll learn more as we go, I suppose. But the jets are going to have to go fast, especially for megahertz rep rates. That much, is, I think, is clear. Um, so they do a lot of damage. This is a an LCP jet. It's actually just a it's actually a grease that's extruding from the um, the tip of a Hamilton syringe that's extruding um, some uh, some grease through. The, so that's a hundred micron thick um, jet there. And what you can see is the the, the exfil beam is just sort of shredding this thing. And uh, so you've got to keep it moving, so you don't want to hit, hit the same spot many times over. Um, the deluxe version of this, this type of injector was um, developed by Uwe Weierstahl and others, and um, there, there are many of them um, uh, that are being used, both in synchrotrons as well as XFELs. Okay, so you've got to keep this thing moving, especially if you're going to use the full fluence of the X-ray beam. Um, <clears throat> And the same sorts of things actually happen in, if you sort of port serial crystallography over to um, synchrotron sources. And you can see here, uh, this is a capillary. It's a glass capillary, and there's a flowing slurry of, of um, lysozyme crystals that are flowing through there. Um, this was a um, movie clipped from uh, when we did these measurements. They're published in Francesco Slato's paper. Um, so that, that's, I think, a 100 micron capillary. And you can see the, the X-ray beam is causing fluorescence. You can see where the beam is. And you can see it's, it's sort of solidifying the sample uh, or the, the stuff that's in the buffer, making a sort of solid matrix of material. And uh, one has to sort of make sure that, that uh, you keep moving along so that, that, so that you can still hit crystals in that case. Um, so so X-ray beams do damage in general, and you've got to keep things moving, um, especially if you try to go to high sort of repetition rate experiments and intense beams. Okay, um, the other thing that the injector has to do is it has to keep the, the sample ideally hydrated and, and at room temperature. So for zero crystallography, we normally want those conditions. Um, it's, it's, it's normally not a problem, but one should probably be aware of the fact that the droplets in a vacuum chamber cool pretty fast, and micro droplets especially. Um, you can find estimates that are on the order of, of a million Kelvin per second, which sounds ridiculously fast or impossibly fast. Um, the good thing about uh, most of the liquid jets that we use is that there's a sheath gas that sort of that that sort of protects the the jet until it just until the very sort of instant that it ejects into the chamber. And they're usually moving pretty fast, um, so the time scales might be on the order of about 50 microseconds, depending on the injector. Um, so so you might still see a couple of degrees um, change in in temperature. Um, I don't know of any especially good measurements of that at the moment. Um, but if it's important, one would, would want to consider that um, when choosing an injector. Um, so, so the other thing we need to do with an injector is it, it needs to conserve sample. Um, so we need to roughly match the size of the injector to the um, size of the x-ray beam. And we also need to match the speed of the injector to, to whatever this blast radius or the x-ray pulse repetition rate. Um, and so one could define one of these really critical parameters, which is the de delivery efficiency of the injector which is sort of geometrically, it's a fraction of sample that's exposed to x-rays. Um, and it depends on how fast this, this stream of, of sample is moving along. Um, but if you roughly sort of estimate what, what the delivery efficiency is, say, for a liquid jet that's moving at 10 meters per second at the LCLS, where you've got 120 hertz repetition rate, I get something like 10 to the minus 5, um, which, is, which is a bit startling. So that's with a micro-focused beam. And so it's certainly not using as much sample as it could. And uh, one, one thing to do is to just slow it down, which is what the LCP injector does, for example. Um, on the other hand, when you get to higher rep rates, this might be about right. That, that speed might be, be needed. 
Um, okay, you also want to conserve beam time. So conserving samples is important because sample can, can um, you know, it's a, it's can be an extreme task to, to make these crystals in the first place and purify their protein and all of that. Um, but it's also that the, the, there's the problem that beam time is costly and um, it costs the, the time and effort of a lot of people and, and the facility. And um, it's, it's sort of precious because we have to go through these proposal processes to get beam time in the first place and usually only one group can use the, the source at one time. Um, so we also have this, in some ways, conflicting demand that, that we want um, a, a lot of uh, data quickly, even sometimes at the expense of wasting sample. Um, so, so the things that you can do are increase the, the number density of, of, your, of your sample in the jet or, or make the jet thicker, for example, which comes at the expense of both um, an increased scattering background as well as uh, sample wastage. Um, so, so hit rate is a really important parameter. Um, so that, that's the fraction of x-rays that hit a target. Um, and that, that can be defined in different ways. Um, but but so, so we call it the hit rate. It's got nothing to do with time. It, it's a, it's a, just a fraction of, of pulses that hit the target. Um, so you can define that in, in various ways. So I define it here as, as the, um, the number density multiplied by the volume of the illumination. So that's roughly the diameter of the jet times the diameter of the x-ray beam squared. And those are typically on the order of maybe 10, well, 1 to 10% for, for crystallography, that, for an experiment that's sort of humming along quite nicely. OK, so hit rate's important. Uh, and the other thing is that we need to be compatible with, with the, the really interesting sorts of dynamic measurements that people want to do, um, which can consist of, of maybe rapidly mixing uh, 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 the the substrate, say, with an enzyme or, or pumping uh, an optically active um, uh, target with an optical laser. And um, x felts are quite powerful in their ability to do these experiments because the, um, the realization that we can use sort of nanocrystals or, or really small microcrystals allows you to reach um, faster time scales, for example, with the fusion, and, um, and to also achieve sort of uniform optical pumping throughout a, a a nanocrystal or, or a microcrystal. And if you look at sort of the attenuation, the attenuation length uh, of, of the pump laser, or if you look at um, the Einstein equation for diffusion, um, you find that um, as you go to bigger crystals, there are these um, nonlinear scalings that work to your disadvantage. The small crystals are quite useful. On the bottom here is a, um, a mixing jet that was, um, that was assembled by Ding Ji Wang at um, ASU um, a couple of years ago. And there, there are some uh, variations of this um, injector that are being developed right now. Okay, and then we also need to um, we need to deal with um, reliability and reproducibility of of nozzles. So we want to we want to avoid um, you know clogging of nozzles, obviously, and, and the time it takes to switch out a nozzle if it does clog. Um, we want these things to be stable so that they're constantly um, they're constantly running throughout the experiment, and they sort of they never um, sort of need to be turned off, more or less. Um, on the upper right, you can see a, a clog that's that's on the on the verge of forming on the, the tip of a, a nozzle. So there's the what you see is the liquid jet coming out of the nozzle, and some material that's sort of accumulated on the tip. And um, it can be difficult to track down the, the sources of these things during an experiment. Um, on the bottom here, what you see is the aggregation of a bunch of material from the buffer so that these nozzles can sort of evolve in time as, as the experiment goes on. Um, so we need to watch out for these things. And um, so I'll, I'll sort of revisit a lot of these topics in a bit when I get into the details of, of jet operation. So that, that was all sort of serial crystallography, the, the, the requirements that we have for those types of experiments, or at least the, the requirements that strike me as being the most important. Um, so for intensity correlation measurements, we also want to shoot um, hydrated targets. So it's, it's much the same. Um, liquid jets or drops can be used. Um, the one thing that's different is that we have a really, we have a really extreme requirement for the stability of the measurements. And um, the, the, the problem is that um, if you look at um, the detector, so this movie's playing here, you should see um, there's a streak that's sort of firing off to the side, which is due to the um, that's due to hitting the, the liquid jet. That's kind of surface scatter from the liquid jet. And there's sort of some flickering going on. It almost looks like candlelight. 
because the, the jet's not as stable as one would hope, even though the jet streak suggests that it is quite stable. And then on top of that, you can see sort of beating um, electronic noise in the detector. And the, the premise of the correlation method is that you can sort of pull out super subtle um, correlations in the sample. And um, I guess the requirement for that is that you need to s discriminate these correlations that arise in, in the detector or the injection mechanism, and they can be coupled together. So sometimes the, um, the, the sort of electronic noise in the detector can depend on the um, sample that's, that's, or sorry, the, the scatter that's hitting the detector. Okay, and, and um, interestingly, if you look at the signal to noise ratio for the correlation method, it, it, it's always sort of at best, it's as good as a, a single particle measurement. So if you compared it to a single shot measurement of a correlation, intensity correlation measurement um, frame to, to just a single molecule being in the beam, um, you'll find when you work through the math that it's not going to be any better than having a single molecule in the beam. Um, and that, I think that's quite an important realization. So that, that's the level of the signal that we're trying to pull out of these measurements. Um, so extreme stability, I think, is the requirement for those for those types of maps. Okay, so and then there's the regime of single particle imaging, which is quite different than than crystallography and um, solution scattering measurements, um, because it involves aerosolized particles. So one one big difference is that um, the flow of of particles in a liquid jet is sort of it's confined to that jet, and it's it's more or less incompressible. A fluid that's more or less incompressible, uh, but in the gas phase, um, the, the name of the game is to, to sort of compress the uh, the particle component of the mixture of, of, of particle and, and carrier gas. And usually, what has to be done to, to accomplish that is to speed up the particle stream and to sort of transversely compress it into a nice collimated or focused stream of, of particles. Um, so, so if you look at the hit rate for single particle imaging. Um, in the case where you have a nano-focused X-ray beam, uh, which is what we need for, for single particle imaging, you need extremely high fluence, which means very small um, focal spot size. The hit rate's on the order of 0.03% in, in the sort of latest measurement. It can certainly be improved from there. Um, so this is, this is very pessimistic, what I write here. But if you took that, that sort of number at face value, you would find that um, it takes quite a lot of days to record say, a million patterns, if that's what we required. Um, so one way to overcome that is to just increase the rep rate of the, um, of the XFEL beam, and, um, but with, with, say, 120 hertz, um, it's a bit devastating that the hit rate is, is that low. Um, so you can work through all of the parameters for, for hit rate and delivery efficiency. They'll, they'll differ from the case of a liquid jet, um, in part because, because it's not an incompressible flow. And, um, if you work out those parameters, you can sort of isolate the ones that need to be improved in order to to, to sort of get more more data uh, quickly and, and to conserve sample. And one of the things is just to um, decrease the speed of the particles um, or to decrease the diameter of the particle stream. So the particle stream is, is, is quite a lot bigger than a typical liquid jet. And I'll come back to this sort of at the end of the, um, of the talk if I get there. Um, so there's there's um, various reviews on on um, crystallography. This this one has a table of, of the different injectors that were used. You can see in the earlier days there's a lot more um, GDVN nozzles, these liquid jets, and then um, the LCP injector sort of I guess came on the scene in, in 2014, and it, it's being increasingly used because it conserves sample, and also lots of developments in fixed um, target injectors. And there's also the electrospinning injector that, that's sort of been around since uh, relatively early in these measurements. It's also quite useful in conserving sample. Okay, um, so that's that's a bunch of the justification or, or, or sort of an explanation of what we need from these injectors. Um, quite quite generally, um, so the 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 rest of, of this next bit is on um, liquid jets for. Um, for delivering hydrated samples, so it's one of many options that, that you would have for for putting hydrated samples into the X-ray beam. Um, on the upper right, there is um, one of the first observations of these types of, of jets. Um, what you see is a hole drilled in a, a plate, and the liquid flowing from a capillary, and there's a pressure difference from the the, 
top to the bottom of the plate, there's a gas flowing through there and it, it um, sort of stretches out the meniscus and um, you have the liquid and makes a, a steady macro thread of liquid. Um, so on the left hand side is, uh, is a sketch of, of how you'd put that together in a sort of compact nozzle um, that would create a micro jet, um, a jet of a few microns from a, a relatively or comparably large capillary, say of 50 micron diameter. So, so the, the jet diameter could be a few microns and the capillary that delivers the, the particles or the solution to the jet is much bigger. And so that's the key to the, this injector is that in, it avoid, avoids clogs by virtue of the fact that the, the tube that, 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 that delivers the sample is, is much bigger than the jet itself. Okay, and there's a pressurized gas that, that uh, drives a, a pressure gradient from the inside to the outside. Um, a jet is formed and it, it eventually spontaneously breaks up into droplets um, through the Rayleigh instability. So a column of liquid is, is intrinsically sort of unstable. Um, so you can get a, a pretty good estimate of what the jet diameter is just by looking. I, I usually think of the Bernoulli equation, um, which is an energy conservation equation. Um, so you've got the, the, the energy density um, associated with the pressure and, and then the kinetic energy of the um, of the, the liquid that's flowing along. So, so rho is the sample density, uh, the liquid density, V is the velocity, P is the pressure. Okay, that's that's uh, gravitational potential. We ignore that. And then on the right-hand side is, so this is on the outside of the nozzle, left-hand side is on the inside of the nozzle. Uh, but you can kill off most of these terms, so gravity doesn't matter. The pressure on the outside doesn't matter much. And um, the velocity on the inside side where the sample's moving pretty slow kind of doesn't matter so much. So really crudely speaking, you just write down a simple um, energy conservation equation for the, the liquid jet. So, so the kinetic energy density equal to the, um, the change in the pressure. Um, so you can estimate the jet diameter from that. So the, the expression below here um, uses exactly the equation above it, but just writes it in terms of the, the volume flow rate. That's Q, the volume per time. P is the pressure. So the jet diameter, very roughly speaking, it goes as a square root of the, the flow rate and, and the volume flow rate and um, the inverse, um, the, the sort of um, the fourth power of the inverse of the pressure. And so if you want to make a smaller jet, you're, you're best off burying the flow rate rather than the pressure. And so the, this equation leaves out a lot of important things like, um, well, things that can be argued are in, unimportant in certain cases, but, but which become important in certain limits. And there's surface drag forces uh, on the liquid jet, and there's there's surface um, tension associated with the meniscus, and there's viscous dissipation in, in the jet, which is of course important as the viscosity goes up. And um, you'll get you'll get a ballpark number of the diameter of the jet from this equation, but you'll be off by factors of, of two or or more um, usually. So so roughly speaking, the rule of thumb that I find is that a, a one microliter per minute flow gives about a one micron jet. And that's been true for most of the nozzles I've looked at. Um, so within, you know, factors of two or so. Okay, um, so the, the factors that, that, that we can sort of control in, in, in the process of, of making these liquid jets are, are the geometrical configuration of the nozzle. And there's a bunch of parameters associated with that. Um, there are our, our control parameters, which are the liquid flow rate and the pressure drop. And those are the knobs we can turn when we're running the experiment. And then there's the characteristics of the sample, so the surface tension, viscosity, and mass density. And then the, the end response out of the system is just the jet radius, or equivalently the jet velocity. So they're, the radius and velocity are sort of coupled by um, incompressibility and continuity. Um, so there's a big parameter space, but there's, there's one thing that, that sort of gives you the response of this, this system. Um, so one would, I guess, you know, naively think you just turn the flow rate down until you get the jet diameter that, that you want, which would be nice, but, but the limits are really set by instabilities in the, in the system, and, and those can be quite complicated. They're, they've been studied in, in quite some detail, especially by um, Alfonso Ganyan Calvo. He's got a series of papers that are all very much worth reading if you're interested in, in understanding where these instabilities come from and sort of how to deal with them. And the paper on the bottom here is a really good one. I recommend that to, to anyone who's interested in this. Um, so, so these instabilities come from uh, various um, sources and different limits. 
um, if I could really crudely state what some of them are, um, which you can find in this paper. Um, so one problem is just when the, the pressure drop is too low um, and you can't overcome the surface tension associated with the uh, liquid so that you, you can't stretch out this meniscus more or less. So it's a crude way of stating what happens. So you, you, you'll get sort of a, a, an oscillating um, or maybe even sometimes pulsing uh, liquid jet that sort of intermittent, intermittently jets and makes sort of a variety of droplet sizes. Um, another problem is when the, the, the pressure is too high. So you could you could conceivably decrease the flow rate or the, the um, jet diameter by ramping up the pressure. Um, but that leads to instabilities due to recirculation cells at the in within the meniscus, as well as the, the, the so-called whipping instability, which causes the liquid jet to whip around. Um, and um, also, just as the, the jet uh, diameter becomes smaller, you have um, just the limitations of the, the instability of the liquid jet, which has to do with um, capillary wave growth. And, and that, that, of course, depends quite a lot on the surface tension of the jet. And the other factors are, are just choosing a poor nozzle geometry. Um, nozzle geometry is usually sorted out either um, empirically just by doing a lot of um, trial and error, or you can estimate what the best geometry is also from from Gagne and Calvo's papers. Also, the other problem is sometimes microcrystals are present, which which is a um, problem that we have oftentimes. Um, so here's a really neat example of, of instabilities in a, a liquid jet. So it, what you see here is a, um, this is just the deposition of droplets on a, a clear um, plastic surface. So the jet's in the background somewhere. Don't worry about where the jet is, but this is the deposition. So if I, I play this set, and you'll see that I turn up the pressure initially. So the jet's whipping around. This is a whipping instability. Um, and then the whipping sort of uh, formation or the amplitude and shape sort of changes. And you'll see it'll snap into a different mode suddenly. So there you go. So it, it, it's sort of it's still in a whipping mode, but it's, it's, it's lost one of its uh, sort of one of the, I guess, the smaller order instabilities that are sort of riding on top of the, the overall whipping instability. So now you see that there's icicles growing back from the um, from the deposition here, so the, the jet's clearly dwelling longer in this period, this um, region. So I'm turning down the pressure and I'll get a stable jet in a moment. Okay, so there comes the jet. So now you can see icicles, whoops, you can see icicles growing back at the very end there. So the jet's nice and collimated. Um, yeah, so the limit when you when you sort of keep increasing, decreasing the flow rate in an attempt to get a smaller jet um, it's mostly due to this sort of recirculation. So one thing you can do to get a, a smaller jet or a lower flow rate is just to scale down the size of the nozzle. And um, Ganyan, Ganyan Kelvo's papers have shown that, that that's an effective approach. Um, you can get a smaller jet just by scaling things down. And it seems to be about linear. And that also sort of agrees with experience um, in trying to make small jets. Um, but you run into a limit that you, you usually can't go smaller than about 40 microns ID for the tube crystallography in, in part because you have a really high resistance to flow so there's a really um, there's a very um, strong penalty for going to smaller tubes there's an inverse fourth power and the resistance to flow and also just because the, the crystals start to clog at some point um, the other things that you could do is work on the geometry of the um, of the nozzle um, tip which people are starting to do now Ganyu Calvo explored these things um, some time ago um, so what you want to do is disrupt this circulation cell that, that's sort of forming in the, um, at the end of the nozzle. Um, so one way to do that is just to stick something in there and just disrupt that. Um, so, so this is the sort of stick in a nozzle trick, as I call it. Um, that, that doesn't work so well for us because we need the crystals to get out of the, the liquid jet. Um, the other thing you can do is, is add a syringe tip to the um, capillary, which changes the, the flow dynamics um, because you have r roughly zero velocity on the surface of the, um, of the, this, um, the substrate here. You can get a small um, jet in that way. Um, the other way is to, to use a free expansion nozzle, um, which sort of avoids some of the circulation that's caused by the, the, the converging, inward converging um, gas flow. At least that's the, the theory as I understand it. I can't claim to fully understand why this works, but I know it does because I've made a lot of nozzles of this type. And they do seem to make smaller jets. Um, so we're now trying to figure out how to do this in a in a way that's not as sensitive to the exact geometry of the nozzles. Um, so, so on the topic of the, the exact geometry of the nozzles and reproducibility, um, 
you can end up with all sorts of quirky jets. So I, I showed the whipping instability that we, we have to sometimes see when we sort of overdo it with the gas pressure. Um, other nozzles are just unstable in various ways. So there's an intermittent jet in the upper left here. These are images with the uh, uh, environmental um, scanning electron microscope. So you can see that this jet is sort of intermittently going and then it, it sort of it stops jetting or the jet sort of sprays off to the side or whips around a bit and then it comes back into a stable jet. Um, so it's a, it's a scanning microscope, so you see this um, sort of periodicity here. Um, and jets can do wild things. They can take, um, this is a, a sub-micron jet that's taking a wild 90 degree, practically 90 degree turn. And it's still a stable jet all the way down here. It breaks up into droplets down here somewhere. And um, you can get things like double jets. So the asperities on the very tip of the um, of that innermost capillary that's delivering the liquid as you take the flow rate down and those asperities uh, matter increasingly more so the geometry is really important and um, so both of the, the top and the bottom here we have a, a double jet that's formed so, so each asperity can sometimes form its own jet and um, unfortunately um, double jets don't double the hit rate that would be nice if they did um, okay so so fabrication so um, you can um, you can fabricate nozzles. You can sort of get started in fabricating nozzles with um, with um, reasonably sort of moderate means. So you can make uh, so-called plain polished jets or or melted capillary um, jets, which is shown on the um, upper left here. Um, that's just the end of a capillary that's been melted and just conveniently forms an almost ideal shape for a, a liquid jet. Um, so here's a melting apparatus on the bottom here, um, and then you just plug in a um, a sharpened capillary into that, that tube. You can sharpen a capillary on a, a grinding disc. And um, this is pretty effective and, and it's still how I think most nozzles are, are made really. And um, with this, this somebody who's developed a lot of skill in making these things, um, it's quite effective and it's, um, it's reasonably um, inexpensive. Um, but still in the end is, is the need for more nozzles and more experiments increases. Um, we should certainly be looking to methods that can sort of mass produce um, nozzles in some means or another. Um, one, one approach is soft lithography. And there's an, a, a paper written by um, Martin Trebin and others, um, Henry Chapman and others, um, which shows how you can make um, nozzles in that way. So you, so you can stamp these things out, I guess, once you've got every, all the, the design parameters sorted out. Um, a limitation is the, the minimum feature size of these. I don't know really what the minimum is, but um, it's it's probably in some cases not as fine as you might want for, say, like a nano jet. Uh, but still, they make jets, and um, it's certainly um, possible. Um, another means of producing these things is is injection molding. And on the top, you see some ceramic injection molded nozzles. Um, those were made by the group at at Seafell and uh, Henry Chapman and Sasha Bot's team. Um, this, this is a paper written by Ken Byerlein. Um, right, and, and that, that's a good way to make that, that outer component of the nozzle. Uh, the problem with injection molding is that you have to pull the mold out, so you're limited to converging components only. So the, the inside, this is an x-ray tomogram of a, of a nozzle. The inside sort of still has this um, glass um, capillary in there that's been made by hand. Um, another means of doing this is 3D printing. Um, on the bottom here, you see a 3D printed nozzle, so it's adhered to a normal glass capillary, but um, sort of the business end of the nozzle can be printed to extremely high precision. On the top you see an array of, of 100 of these types of nozzle tips, slightly different, but, but the same idea, also made with the same printer. And um, right, 3D printing seems like a really great way to do this because of the flexibility, so you're not limited by, you're, you're practically not limited by feature sizes and um, you're not limited in geometry so much as you are with, say, injection molding the nozzle. Uh, that's the nozzle that I showed before next to a match head. It's, so it's printed by one of these these things here. Um, they're not cheap, uh, but they're extremely um, sort of powerful and flexible. This is the design um, on the right here that was made by Garrett Nelson um, in collaboration with uh, Michael Hyman. So this was done at ASU um, in collaboration with um, CFEL. Um, Right, so you can see how flexible these, these things uh, can be. So I think 3D printing is a great way forward. Uh, as far as practical matters go in running nozzles, I guess for people who haven't sort of 
ran these things before, you might be surprised to find out how sort of devastating icicles can be when running a liquid jet. Um, so you can see that in the movie here, there's um, so here's the nozzle, and the, it's forming a an icicle that's that's sort of like a stalagmite growing back. Um, and uh, the, the problem with this is, is well, in, in one part, it just sort of plugs up the nozzle. That's really annoying. Um, the, the more annoying thing is the ice diffracts like crazy, and it, it can kill detector pixels. Um, and it's even worse if it's not uh, pure water, if, it, if you have um, salt and peg and other things in your, um, in your buffer. Um, so liquid jets, uh, sort of, um, if, if you haven't designed the catcher for the, the liquid, you can run into this problem. Um, so it's really annoying. Um, uh, so let's see. The other, the other thing is is sort of pre-testing of nozzles, which is a really important uh, factor in experiments. This is probably it might seem obvious, but but um, these things really need to be pre-tested with the sample that you plan to use in the experiment. So you have to give up some of the of the, the precious sample to make sure that all is well in in the liquid jet system. And I can't stress that enough. Um, so if you're testing, it's a good idea to, to have a, a good test set up and have all of the measurements that you need. Uh, measuring uh, gas and liquid flow rates is, is quite important because um, pressures aren't the final indicator. It's the flow rates that matter the most. And um, it's good to have pulsed elimination so you can really see what's happening with the jet. If you, if you, have, um, if you just have time averaged imaging, it sometimes can be difficult to see what's really going on. The jet could be wandering off periodically. You might not even notice that. Um, so pulsed imaging is good. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, so run your precious sample through the jet at least briefly, but also check that the sample's making it out of the, the complete plumbing. So we've learned that lesson um, before, and um, it's, it's a harsh uh, sort of lesson to learn um, to find that the sort of crystals are sort of not making it through the, the system despite the fact that you have a liquid jet and despite the fact that the solution itself might make beautiful powdered fraction. Um, it can get plugged up in various places in the um, system. Um, so another thing that comes up often is, is um, the question of whether or not when you test your nozzle and your test setup, it's going to behave the same when you put it into the, into the, you know, whatever chamber you're using, like the CXI chamber at LCLS. And um, I believe that they, they will. They, they, they ought to behave the same. And if they don't, it's probably not the nozzle. It's probably something else. That, that something in the nozzle has changed, but it's not the actual jetting process that's the issue. Um, in part, that's due to, to the realization that the flow through a small orifice is choked. And um, what that means is that the mass flow rate doesn't increase or change at all if you decrease the chamber pressure beyond a certain point. For helium gas, that ratio is about two. The ratio in, in practice is, is much huger than two. So the pressure in the, in the nozzle is like 30 bar, and the pressure in the chamber is maybe 0.1 millibar or so. And so the mass flow rate is not going to change much if you decrease the, the chamber pressure and, and the, the simple um, expression of that is that the, as far as the liquid jet's concerned, vacuum is vacuum. You can decrease it more, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but but I sort of tested that in the ESEM just to see that that's a sensible interpretation of what's going on, and it certainly seems to be the case. So on the left-hand side, there you have a liquid jet that's um, I think that's at about 10 to the minus um, two millibar, and on the right-hand side is about a millibar. So it's a range of 100-fold change in in the um, pressure. You can see that in the background on the right-hand side image. And the jet's identical. It doesn't look any different. So, so as far as the nozzle is concerned, it doesn't care what that pressure is. OK. Um, yeah, and, and there are a bunch of factors that come into play when you do um, time-resolved experiments. Um, in particular, so if you do like laser pump x-ray probe experiments, um, the, the timing is set by the your electronic triggering of when you light up the sample and when you illuminate it with the x-rays. So the, that timing in principle is, isn't too bad to, to get done, especially if you're looking at sort of nanosecond time scales or so that can be done electronically. But there's also the question of where in the heck the, the, the crystal was at the time that it, it was illuminated and where, well, you know where it is when it's hit by the X-rays, but you may not know where it is when it's hit by the um, optical laser. Um, so one has to consider the, the factors that play into that. Um, and you can sort of try to estimate and trace back where that, that particle was in the tube um, on average um, before it got hit by, by the, the x-ray beam. Um, and so that it's not too hard to estimate, but you have to realize that there's also a dispersion in the velocity due to the parabolic flow profile in, in, the, in the jet 
and then the tubes. So you can see that here. You can see some of the um, some of the uh, the crystals here are moving really slow along the edges. They're just sort of sliding along there, and the ones in the middle are going quite a lot faster. And those are all relevant factors. Um, so one one of the ways to get rid of uh, most of the the problems. Um, it seems, which is almost like a miracle solution, is, is the jet in jet, liquid jet in liquid jet geometry. Um, so that, that's shown here. This was um, done by Kanye and Calvo. Um, there, there are variations of this um, that have been built by um, Seafell and, and um, ASU and Cornell and, and elsewhere. Um, so Lois Pollock's group, Henry Chapman's, um, uh, John Spence, and Uwe Beierstahl, and others. Um, uh, so, so yeah, this, these jets are really quite amazing. I, I didn't realize how, how significant uh, the improvement could be by switching to this um, geometry. So you've got a little bit more of uh, a nuisance that you have to now control a second flow, uh, but it's, it's not that bad really. But, but one thing is that the outer sheath flow of the outer jet, it, it stabilizes the jet. So you get rid of um, all sorts of these things like whipping instabilities and things like that. Um, and you can keep the jet basically running forever and you can turn off the a sample flow on the inside, and there's no switchover process. Um, really, the jet kind of doesn't doesn't see that switchover process so much. Um, so it's been said that running a jet is sort of like um, like uh, flying in an airplane. Once you're up in the air, everything's fine, but uh, it's takeoff and the landing that that one worries about. And it's when you turn the jet on and off that things tend to sputter. Um, right. So you you can control the the flow rate of the sample, um, and the sample tends to be sort of streamlined in the middle the jet. And um, so the, the streamline also for time resolved experiments can, can sort of remove the, um, the timing dispersion due to that parabolic flow um, in the capillary tube. So, so you can also recess the, um, so this, this image here, if I can find my mouse, um, this image here shows a, um, the protruding uh, version of the inner jet, but you can re sort of recede that into the capillary as well. Um, Right, and, and also the um, the outer flow could be the could carry the um, substrate that's sort of initiating enzyme reactions from um, sort of dynamic measurements of, of mixing. Okay, um, so I'm going to skip this one. Um, so I have I have practically no time left. Uh, it's not that much of a surprise. So I won't be able to say a whole lot about aerosol injectors. So I covered a lot of stuff with um, liquid jets. Um, a lot of practical things. Um, very little theory. I think the theory, the place to look for that is Gagne and Calvo's papers, um, some of which I, I showed on my slides. Um, so I'll, I'll just say a few things really briefly about aerosol injectors. Um, it's a different regime than liquid jets, almost, uh, you know, completely. Um, so, so the idea with an aerosol injector is that um, for these single particle measurements, we, we want to sort of pull these viruses or, or protein molecules out of solution and, and into a non-native environment, really, which is um, a vacuum, possibly with a, a small layer of hydration. Um, to do that, we'd, we'd use some sort of a nebulizer source, which, which could be one of the liquid jets that I showed before, or an electrospray nebulizer or similar. Um, and then that, that sort of mist of, of little droplets would find its way into an aerodynamic lens stack. And, and prior to making its way in there, um, one can pull off some of the um, gas load with a, a set of skimmers and a, and a pump. Um, and that would set the, um, the pressure or the mass flow rate of, of gas through the lens stacks. That's the, one of the tuning parameters, how much gas you skim off. And uh, the job of these lenses is to focus these particles. Um, so a picture of, of the um, aerosol injector that's, that's presently in use is on the bottom here. So it, it looks a lot bigger than a liquid jet. So liquid jets, you know, sort of a millimeter in size. This injector is, is quite big. It's about a meter long. Um, but the overall apparatus, all things considered, is about the same as um, a liquid jet apparatus when you sort of combine all of the components. Um, but the, the focusing mechanism is uh, usually a lot bigger. Um, so, so the basic principle here in aerodynamic focusing is that um, if, you, if you have a, a particle stream that goes through a converging and diverging section. So if you just put an aperture um, along that path, they're, they're about a, a couple of millimeters in size normally. Um, there, there are sort of two relevant time scales here. Um, one is the time scale that it takes for the gas to tra traverse this obstacle, which is this aperture. 
and that's roughly um, roughly the diameter divided by the speed of the gas. Um, and the other time scale is the the, the characteristic time that it takes a um, particle to respond to a, a change in the in the flow direction or the flow speed. And so that's called the relaxation time, or you might call it the response time. And that depends on the drag forces, and uh, the scaling of the particle size uh, depends on the pressure and size of the particle and so on. Um, but so the, the, the parameter of interest is the Stokes number, which is um, the ratio of those two time scales. So if the particle responds very quickly compar comparably to the time scale for this, this um, contraction cycle to happen, it's just going to follow the streamline. So the particle was really small. So if you tried to focus, say, a helium atoms with helium flow, you can do that. They would just follow the streamlines on average. Um, but if, if, if the particles were slightly more massive, um, they would slip across the streamlines by, by virtue of the fact that um, they've got more inertia. And so that, that's kind of what I'm trying to illustrate here. Is that, um, so they take a little time to respond to the change in the gas, so they, they lag behind, and then it's accelerating in, and then it slips again across the streamline. Now it's going a lot faster. It tries to expand, but it just can't expand as much as the, the streamline has expanded. Um, so this is all described quite nicely, I think, in this paper by um, by Liu et al. and Peter McMurray's group. Um, it's a good paper to read if you want to learn about aerosol injectors, and, and papers that reference this um, are good to look at. Um, so th there's a general tendency for particles to migrate towards regions of higher density um, in a, an incompressible and irrotational, irrotational flow. So what you want to do is contract and expand many times. Okay, and if the grass pressure was turned down way too low, uh, particles simply uh, simply don't um, respond enough and they start banging into walls and transmission efficiency goes down. Um, so here's an, an image of a, a particle stream shooting out of um, that injector that I showed before. So it's lit up with um, a laser beam and, and we've sort of recently realized that we can, we can actually image these things. It took a lot longer to to realize that we can we can image an aerosol beam just because the particles are small and they don't scatter light very easily, um, but if you put a bright enough laser on them, you can see the the stream. Um, so we're building in sort of diagnostics to 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 help with delivery efficiency. So practical matters like like just seeing where the particle beam is and being able to overlap it with the um, with the X-ray beam um, efficiently. So it looks like I'm almost out of time. I think I started a few minutes late. Um, so there's there's variations on the aerosol injector. Um, we we tried a variation which was um, sort of a, a scaling down <coughs> of, of the aerosol injector to the size of a liquid jet. In fact, using one of the ceramic injection molded pieces that we had on hand, which would normally be used to make a liquid jet. And so we just pulled out the inner capillary and um, let the particles um, sort of uh, the the particle gas mixture flow into the nozzle. And um, that was quite effective in making a really small particle. It looks a lot like um, a bit like a, a liquid jet, and it's focused to dimensions that are quite similar to a liquid jet. And the mechanism here might be understood just by virtue of the fact that, that the nozzle's at atmospheric pressure and the particles speed up in a converging trajectory, and they suddenly find themselves at a very low pressure where the drag forces sort of aren't enough to, to fully um, expand the... Um, uh, the, the particle beam and cause it to diverge. That's what's seen on the um, was seen on the lower right there. And so here's some optical um, pulsed laser images of of of, of a sort of nanoparticles going into uh, the chamber. You can see a, a converging beam, and after some image processing, you can get quantitative measures of the um, projected particle density, which is the, the, the parameter that's related to the hit rate. So that's what the X-ray beam sees, and that's what we want to quantify. That's what we want to optimize. Um, so we've gotten these beams down to about 1.8 microns, um, full width half max, which is, I think, pretty impressive. So it's about the size of uh, even what we would call a small liquid jet. Um, in some ways, it's almost too small if you start to think about it. Um, so, so that's worked. We've done that in experiments. We've run that injector in some experiments. We have a lot of kinks to work out. The transmission efficiency is not as good as we would like. It's actually quite far off from what we would like. Um, We've also collected um, crystal diffraction from our, our aerosol injector. And um, what was nice is that we could see that um, the, 
So background could be reduced hugely, of course, because you get rid of all the liquid. And um, so the, the comparison of the background is shown here. So that's the, this is the water, um, the water ring there from, from many shots, histograms. Uh, that, that number up there is 800. These are just raw data units. And the number here is three. That's an aerosol background. So it's very, very small. Um, and um, if the efficiency was good and, and if the crystals could tolerate being in vacuum briefly, so they, they need to be in vacuum for about 750 nanoseconds uh, with that injector, um, what's neat is that you could sort of conceivably do a better job of measuring things like these shape transforms that we're interested in by just killing off all this background. And if, if the sort of signal between shape transforms, between the frag points is sort of independent of the number of um, molecules in the crystal, that would be quite significant. All right, the rest I'm, I'm not going to present because I've just run out of time. And I, it seems that that would happen. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it here. Um, so just as a, I guess as a teaser, we're also trying to, to deliver particles, aerosol particles, precisely to the um, to the focus of the X-ray beam with, with, through optical forces. So it may be that we need to introduce additional forces into this um, into this um, equation, um, which we can't seem to achieve with the aerosol injector alone. All right, so I think that's that's it. Yeah, that's it for so now. Rick, uh, we don't really have any strict time restraints on this, so yeah. it, um, if you have a lot of I don't know how many slides you have left, but if you'd like to keep going. I can show a few. Let, so I can give, um, yeah, so let's see what I can do in maybe like five, five or ten minutes. Um, okay, well, so we'd like to, so the thing with aerosol injectors is that this, this is like this sort of, um, this process is kind of limited by the, the sort of inertia of the particles. So you need to speed up the particles to achieve um, compression. One way or another, you have to speed up the particles to do um, focusing aerodynamically, or so it seems, because th really the reason you can focus is because the particles have a higher mass than, than the, um, the gas molecules, um, very roughly speaking. Um, so so we, we think we need to introduce another force. Um, here's a really neat example of, of a particle being trapped by a laser beam. This is our one of our collaborators on um, this project. So this is a measurement made by them, not, not made by myself. Uh, but that's a that's a particle. That, it's fairly big. It's a it's a microparticle, maybe some tens of microns. Um, it's trapped in a laser beam in the hollow core of a donut-shaped laser beam. The laser beam is shooting from this side, this way. It's moving because there's radiation pressure pushing it, and it's confined uh, because of this dark spot. And it's it's in open atmosphere. Um, this tube is just there to prevent a, a draft from kicking the particle out. Okay, it moves really far. So it moves um, a meter and a half distance or so. Um, it takes a while to get there, and all the way to the point where they've they've run out of tube. And um, so what's really impressive here is that um, so trapping particles with with um, optical tweezers or um, uh, scattering forces is limited to much smaller length scales, so millimeter type length length scales. Um, but this is this is a meter and a half, and um, yeah, the reason why you can do that is because um, it, it utilizes a different force mechanism. It, it, ex use, it utilizes the exchange of momentum between the particle and the surrounding gas. It's not using light momentum to do this. And um, if you look at the momentum of a, a photon, it's the energy divided by the speed of light. Whereas the momentum of a, a gas molecule is the energy divided by the velocity of the gas molecule. Again, the velocity of the gas molecule is much smaller than the speed of light. Um, so, so so this is the, the momentum from the gas is much higher. That, that's assuming that they're at sort of the same temperature, uh, which they won't be because um, sort of a green laser would, would be roughly corresponding to the temperature of um, the surface of the sun, which we're not going to do to our particles. But, but even when you consider um, the, the lower temperature of the particle, um, you can still get orders of magnitude increase in the force that's exerted on the particle. So that, that's how these radiometers work. It's got a paddle, it's got a dark side and a bright side. And sitting on my windowsill, um, uh, the Arizona sun pushes this thing along quite, quite readily. It's, it's heating up the black side of the paddle much more than the, the white side of the paddle. And um, it wouldn't work if there wasn't gas in here. Uh, but it does because there is gas in there and the, the heating is non-uniform. So that's what drives these things. And it's not photon, 
not radiation pressure. Radiation pressure would, would take, um, say, maybe hundreds of days to turn this pedal around. Um, so you, you can um, sort of, you, you can move microparticles and nanoparticles around if you can achieve a, a small temperature difference across the surface. And interestingly, if you just do a, a very rough calculation, just take the ideal gas law and um, have a look at what the um, acceleration is as a result of putting a small temperature difference across a particle, and you'd find quite readily that even something like a one Kelvin temperature difference across, say, a virus of, of you know some hundred or a couple hundred nanometers in size can result in hundreds or thousands of Gs of, of acceleration. It's, it's a lot of acceleration, uh, provided that um, something like a virus, say, can tolerate that, that um, temperature difference which um, presumably they can, um, at least for some of the, the more robust ones. Okay, so here's a particle that, that's trapped inside of the donut beam. And this is a, a, a illustration of the mechanism here. So it's non-uniform heating of the particle. And a particle that's levitating in a diverging laser beam, uh, whenever it wanders off from the dark spot, it picks up a bit of, of, of temperature increase on that side of the particle. And, and the, the gas molecules just recoil with a greater momentum exchange. Um, okay, um, so, so here's, here's a, a finale of, of some of the work that we've been doing. So we don't have as much control as we'd like, but what, what you can see in this movie, let me restart it, um, here it goes. Um, so here comes a particle, it, it's, a, it's about a one micron or so. There's a laser beam shooting upwards, and the particle has been fired in from an aerosol injector, and um, it's been captured at the focus of the um, of the, the laser beam, so it's a donut-shaped laser beam. Um, here's, here's Salah Awell and, and Nico Eckerskorn, they're PhD students who were working on this project. I spent a lot of time building this um, rig with, with them during my postdoc in Henry Chapman's group. Um, so we can shoot particles in, and um, at least micron-sized particles, those are our, our dummy viruses for now. They're polystyrene particles. Um, and uh, we can sometimes trap these particles not quite as controlled as we'd like, but um, I think the proof of concept is kind of there. And it, it's probably possible to do this. So it, it's an exploratory project still at, at this stage. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Time scale. And, and the, oh, so it's two milliseconds between frames. So actually it's about right. So if you're doing using LCLS, LCLS is what, 8.3 milliseconds between shots. So, uh, so it's spending sort of two, four, six, eight, and, okay, a bit too much time. But close. But close, yeah, it's just kind of naturally worked out that way. Um, okay, the problem is that the next particle that came in sort of trapped at a different position. And so one has to carefully uh, work on both the, the, the aerosol injector that seeds these particles into the laser as well as the laser beam itself. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of optimization to do, uh, but it, it may be possible. Okay, so okay, now that's really the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks for listening.